Good morning, everyone. Come on in. Well, I don't know what just happened there. Okay. Uh, for a brief second, Shanda, you became the person of interest on my screen. <laughs> it, was, it was like just you up there. I was like, oh, wait, wait, wait. Sorry about that. Uh, all right. We've got a lot of people coming in. We're already up to nine. I have a quick question. Yes, ma'am. Go for it. Are you going to record these labs and post them? Or yes. If not, I'm going to. Okay. Because if not, I'll send you a request to record. But if you're recording it, I don't have to. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's recorded. Hi, Jerry. How's it going? You're muted, but I thought I recognized your name. Ain't that a big guy learning actual names and remembering them and then even recognizing their face. I'm, I'm growing up. I'm going to be a grown up. You're still muted. Hold on, bud. There you go. Now you're, what did you say, Jerry? Sorry. Uh, just, uh, because, uh, did we have a, did we have a zoom on Tuesday? Uh, for lecture, but not for lab. For lecture. So I missed that. Uh, yeah, yeah, but here you go. Let, let me show you something real quick. I'll do share screen. And, and this is something I needed to show everybody anyway, so I'm not losing any time by doing this. Uh, here's the actual my la uh, Physics Solutions, my uh, YouTube channel. And this right here is recording for lab. If you see introduction to measurement and uncertainty. That's the actual recording for lab that you missed, but the recording for lecture that you missed is uh, this guy right. Uh, let me see which one. Actually, because the names are so similar, it's kind of hard to tell. I think it's this one, actually. Yeah, this is 242D01B. Uh, that's something else I've been trying to tell my students uh on the Zoom meetings is in the description of the video. It'll have the second line down will be PHY 242D01B space 0108-2024. Every video uh, that I've made has something like that. And that's the title of the video that I posted, uh, the actual video itself, not what I called it on YouTube, but it's also the title of the document where the notes are. So my my notes are on uh, Google Docs with that naming nomenclature, not just for you, Jerry, but for everybody. Google Docs. Yeah, it's Google Docs. There's a link to that in my uh, in my Canvas channel as well, or my Canvas page as well. I need more words, more things to think about. All right, I'm going to go back to that Google or it'll start Docs. playing all of a sudden. So, yeah, that was the other one. Uh, I did have another class, uh, internet class, and that internet class has the same title as that one just did, except I think it says uh, Tuesday and, uh, at the end of it just to help people find it. Uh, did that answer your questions, Jerry? Help you figure out what you uh, kind of. I, gotta, I guess I got to fish around to uh, figure out, uh, yeah, what I missed. Yeah, you didn't miss much, to be honest with you. What I did was told them about the atomic theory of matter, uh, you know, the existence of atoms and the fact that they make up, you know, everything or atoms can come together and make molecules. And then I introduced them to this new unit of mass, which is called the unified atomic mass unit. And that's pretty much it. So you didn't miss much. Okay. I would not worry about it one iota, but I, I would try to look back at that just in case you... Uh, understand it but you probably have a pretty good understanding of what i was talking about anyway so it might not even matter all right so i've got all this done 
anybody have any questions? I, I told everybody during lecture and during lab last time that I would be making the syllabus and getting all that done that night. Well, it turned out I was having an allergic reaction and I'm uh, now on prednisone and Benadryl. So I fell asleep really quickly that night and still haven't done it, but hopefully I should knock it out sometime today during the day. Okay. So it's not posted yet. It's not that you've missed anything. Go ahead. I yeah. have a question. Yeah, I, I'm pretty groggy. I'm on a bunch of uh, allergy stuff because I had a food allergy Saturday. So I'm in the same boat with you. <laughs> I barely remember last night's Zoom class because I was on Claritin and Benadryl and they had to switch me to some prescription pipe steroid cream. Anyway, <laughs> um, the I, I couldn't get into the book. I found to get into the lab through your through how to get into the Pearson my lab okay for the class but I didn't see my ebook on there anymore it's gone is there another menu to go to or is let it me let me show you where where you're supposed to be able to access it so over here where it says Pearson remember it doesn't say my lab and mastering anymore I don't know why but that's what it's happened so I mm -hmm. click on that and what I've discovered for your ebook is you can go down here to where it says student links which hopefully y'all have this and I click on Pearson eText. Okay. You should have access to that. I'm not sure you will though, because there's some uh, some licenses. I was told they don't do this anymore, but there might still exist licenses that allows people to use my lab and mastering without the eText. If that's the case, then you might be in that category, and you'd have to have the other one. Uh, but you, I, can contact I don't know. Con you said contact the. Technical support semester, because I bought though, right? the e-text and the lab for a year. I thought. Yeah. The yeah. E and you had the book last year, right? I mean, last semester. Yeah, I had it on the computer. I had okay, the book yeah, last so they, year. Yeah. So it should definitely be showing. Okay. Okay. Thanks, that's all. Yeah. This is the topic that I covered there, Jerry. Uh, atomic theory of matter. Uh, I actually made an argument so that the, that everybody would understand that this is basically one over 1,000 times Avogadro's number. So the conversion factor between unified atomic mass units and kilograms is uh, just a, it's it's another version of Avogadro's number. So you really don't have to memorize anything. You can just take uh, one and divide it by parenthesis 1000 times Avogadro's number, and that'll convert it to kilograms. If you left off the thousand, it would convert it to grams. So that was sort of the only thing that I think was even remotely interesting that I, I gave you. Everything else was pretty much boilerplate stuff. Elizabeth's here. All right. Uh, I was going to use some of this time to uh, do a little bit of lecture stuff, but I actually got several students from other lectures altogether, so I'm not sure I'm going to do this. I just remind you that this chapter 17, which may, which is likely the only one, uh, is pretty straightforward, so I'm not too terribly worried. If I don't cover every little nook and cranny of the chapter, I'm not worried. Uh, you can still sort of figure it out to some extent. But if you have questions, definitely let me know, because between the, the topics that I cover in the meetings, as well as the videos that I link to, as well as any videos you might want to find on my YouTube channel or on the Internet in general, I think you can get ample help with understanding this chapter because we're basically just going to go through if i show you this over here it might help uh we're going to go through chapter 17 which starts off with the atomic theory of matter temperature and thermometers which i did cover to some extent in your class on uh at two o'clock on monday uh but basically any parameter we find that varies directly or indirectly, but varies with temperature, you can use to make a thermoscope. And once you calibrate it, it becomes a thermometer. And uh, I talked about, you know, a mercury thermometer, a, a alcohol thermometer, a toluene thermometer. Uh, I talked about thermistors and, and stuff like that, things that use resistance as a uh, thermometric measure. And uh, I talked about temperature scales. So uh, those are the other two topics I forgot that I had talked about on Monday, Jerry, that I didn't tell you about. Uh, but the rest of it's uh, thermal equilibrium, the zeroth law. I just I'll reiterate to you guys, and this will help everybody, even people that aren't in my lecture. The zeroth law of thermodynamics is uh, is real is a real thing, believe it or not. But basically, what we realized is after the fact, we realized we hadn't really secured this fundamental fact, which needs to be secured. But basically, the idea is if you put two objects in contact with one another, let's say A and B, and then there's a third object C. 
But if you put A and B in thermal contact with each other, if they're in thermal equilibrium, then uh, no heat will be transferred between them. And that would mean the temperature of A is equal to the temperature of B. Uh, but if you now take object B and put it in thermal contact with C and no, fl no heat flows between those, then temperature B is equal to temperature C as well. That's the zeroth law of thermodynamics. Uh, it seems common sense to us, but to be honest with you, you just we hadn't uh, you know dotted that I and crossed that T, so they wanted to make sure they did that. Uh, and in thermal equilibrium, the definition of that is not that they have the same amount of heat. It's not that they have the same amount of pressure. It's not that they have the same amount of volume. It's strictly speaking that they have the same temperature. So if you put two things uh, in contact with each other, uh, no matter what they are, if they're physically contacting each other, they will eventually reach thermal equilibrium. Uh, and that thermal equilibrium uh, is characterized by the two objects having the exact same temperature. Then we're doing uh, thermal expansion, specifically linear expansion, volume expansion. We'll talk about the anomalous behavior of water uh, around four degrees Celsius. Uh, basically everything, almost everything expands when the temperature increases and contracts when temperature decreases. Water has this wonderful property that at some part of its temperature span, it doesn't do that. In fact, it goes the opposite way. And that's sort of been quote unquote life-saving in that it's maintained uh, even the the bottom of moderately deep to extremely deep uh, bodies of water will never freeze solid. So that actually allows for life to extend beyond a, uh, a thermal freeze or anything like that, an ice age. And then we're going into ideal gas laws, which basically most everyone has already uh, solved in the past. If you haven't, then you might need a little extra time with it. But uh, you're going to need to be able to solve ideal gas laws and both the version with Avogadro's number as well as the version with the, uh, with the ideal gas constant R. And that's basically it for Chapter 17. So that's what we're going to cover. I'm going to go ahead and stop uh, sharing the screen, uh, assuming no one has any questions about that. Anyone? Okay. All right. So let's stop sharing there and come back to me. Looks like we got 14 of you guys in here. I saw Darren. I didn't recognize you, Darren, with a hat on. But I did remember that your name has an R in it, your last name. <laughs> Poor Darren. All last semester, I, I could not pronounce his name, even though it's it's like five letters, so it's not a big deal. <laughs> but anyways, let, let's get started. Uh, today, we're going to learn the techniques of Excel that if you took my 241 class or any 241 class at TCC, uh, you would have already learned this technique. Uh, what what our lab is, is it's currently transitioning between uh, what it has been to what it's going to be, and we're slowly getting to that what it's going to be, which includes error propagation, which is the more complicated but definitely much more useful method of uh, propagation of error. So we traditionally in the freshman and sophomore level of science classes use sig figs and, and that sort of stuff for figuring out what happens to a number that has, let's say a number has uncertainty, which is all numbers and all measured numbers at least. So when you have a number that has an uncertainty and you use that in a formula and combine it with other possible numbers that have uncertainty in them, what's the uncertainty of the output? So when you put it through that formula, it spits out an answer. What exactly is the uncertainty in that final answer? Well, we have a method that we use, but it really isn't the, the one that real scientists use. It's uh, scientific notation. And basically, once you determine the number of sig figs a particular piece of data has, then if you multiply or divide that piece of data with another piece of data, then you have to round the answer to the number of sig figs of the number that you put in that had the least. If you add and subtract numbers that uh, with certain numbers of sig figs, the sig figs aren't really that relevant. What happens there is the number with the least precision dictates the answer of the precision of the la of the answer. So, for instance, if if you're adding a number that has 12 decimal places to a number that has three decimal places, then you have to round the result to three decimal places because the three decimal place number has less precision than the 12 decimal place number. 
And then finally, if you let some kind of function operate on a number or numbers, so a, a function like logarithm or a function like e to the x or sine, if you let that operate on a number uh, with a certain number of sig figs, then the answer should have the same number of sig figs that the number you put into it had. That's sort of the only rules with sig figs, and it's it's pretty convenient, and it works a lot of times. But if you look in my uh, Canvas page, you'll see in week one, I've gave some documents that uh, explain the rules I just went over, but it also has a link to a video that shows you when uh, sig figs fail. So that can give you a real-life example of how sig figs fail. So we're currently transitioning to uh, at least training you on that proper technique of error propagation, uh, but every lab has not yet included that type of error propagation. So that's why we're still in transition. Uh, the other thing that our lab does is we're really trying to nail down uh, the tried and true sort of scientific process when you're starting with a new science. So this isn't like, you know, how does science progress right now after, you know, 105 years of general relativity? Uh, that's not the science that I'm kind of talking about because there's, it's just too many things going on. But when you uh, first encounter something like Enrico Fermi did uh, in the uh, 1930s and 40s or whatever, uh, actually 1940s, uh, when Enrico Fermi started to discover and investigate the nucleus, we knew nothing. So really, it was just a, a plug and chug sort of situation where, you, where we do things like, well, how big is the nucleus? Well, what variables does the size of the nucleus depend on? Uh, they ultimately figured out that it depended on the, uh, the atomic number, which is Z. And one of the first experiments uh, done was, let's do a plot of uh, nuclear diameter versus Z. And then you'll do nuclear diameter squared versus Z and nuclear diameter cubed versus Z and nuclear diameter to the one half versus Z and nuclear diameter to the one third versus Z. And you keep doing all that until you find finally a straight line. And once you find a straight line, then you know you've got either a linear or a directly proportional relationship between the uh, nuclear diameter and the atomic number Z. Uh, if it's uh, directly proportional, then the line will not only be a straight line, but it'll go right through the origin. Whereas if it's a linear relationship, it'll be a straight line that does not hit the origin. Uh, that's the whole process. Now, I, I mentioned raising uh, the nuclear density, or excuse me, the nuclear diameter to various powers. But the next step, if none of those worked out, would be go back to the uh, nucleus diameter being raised to the one power and start trying various powers of Z. And then if that doesn't work out either, then you start trying uh, multiplication uh, or multiple uh, variables being raised to a power. So for instance, you would try uh, maybe the nuclear diameter raised to the two power and the atomic number Z raised to the three power. That's a very reasonable thing to do. And you keep doing all those different ways until you find something that really looks linear. And uh, ideally, you would like to have some kind of theoretical structure of why that's the case. But when the science is brand new, like it was when Enrico Fermi was at University of, of uh, Ch Chicago working out the details of nuclear physics, uh, and before that, he was in Italy. But when you're at that stage, you're just trying to figure out stuff. There's no existing theory or not much of an existing theory. I think uh, Niels Bohr had written a paper on treating the nucleus as a, a, a bubble of liquid. Uh, but that wasn't quite good enough to, to work out the details. I think that was even Niels Bohr's PhD thesis. But that's the way science goes. And that's what we're going to do in here. We're going to investigate things. In, in most cases, we're going to act like we don't know what's going on uh, with the underlying theory. And we're going to do things like, well, how does the distance compare to the velocity? So you can make a graph of distance and vo versus velocity and then try, you know, distance to various powers, then try velocity to various powers, and then try distance to various powers and velocity to various powers at the same time. And then you do the same thing for time and you say do the same thing for velocity versus time and velocity versus distance and so on and so forth. So what we need to be able to do that type of science is an ability to rapidly uh, experiment and make graphs 
and then make graphs uh, of various powers of variables and then do a curve fit. Uh, traditionally, curve fits uh, were done uh, so, so more or less by hand. Like you would, you would try to draw your graph on as large a paper as possible, and then you would get as many data points as possible because the fewer you have, the more error there could be. But you get a buttload of data points, and then you try to find one single line, maybe by using a transparent ruler, uh, one single line that fits all of those points equally well. Once you do that, then you completely forget about the data points and just take the points on that line and you say y equals mx plus b and you grab a specific y, you grab a specific x and uh, you look at what the m is and you look at what the b is and that's going to be your formula. That's that's sort of the best case scenario. Now, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. How do you decide what the outliers are? I mean, is there a formula for a type of percentage error for the outliers on that one? Absolutely. And that's a, a step beyond where we're going or where we're okay. at to by then. But yeah, you, there is absolutely a process. And early on, you probably wouldn't throw any of them out. Uh, but once you've got a nailed down theory, what allows us to toss uh, data points is when the data point that you think is an outlier is different from, I'll say the mean, but I'll put quotation marks around it because there's some ambiguity in what I mean when I say the mean of a, of a linear equation. Uh, but in some sense, if that outlier is three standard deviations from that line, then you're automatically allowed to throw it away and then recalculate. So that's that's the, and actually, it's not three standard deviations. We generally use three standard errors. Let me correct that. It's three standard, three standard errors. errors. Remember, if uh, those of you who had me in 241, I used S sub X for the standard deviation of X. And then I used the Greek letter Sigma, which sort of looks like a, a faceless baby with a with a curly cue of hair. Okay, so that, that Sigma sub X would be the standard okay. error of X. And it's found by taking the standard deviation and dividing it by the square root of the number of trials. Okay, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the way you do that in the graph, because I did speak sort of off the cuff about the mean of a linear equation, that doesn't make much sense. But what you do have uh, on any graph, whether it's linear or not, is you have error bars associated with the data. Uh, so one thing you can think about is you you consider the error bar, maybe even to be uh, conservative, you take the one with the largest error bar. And if it's an error bar in the vertical function, uh, the ver vertical variable, which is the dependent variable, then if you go up three error bars and that data point is outside of that, then that would be how you do it from a graph, how you uh, discard that piece of outli outlier data. Does that make sense? Okay, so yeah, the scientific process will be mostly uh, figuring out for your particular experiment, what is the dependent and what is the independent variable. I, okay. I do want to reiterate to you that we always put the dependent variable on the vertical or Y axis and the independent variable, which is the one you're free to make anything you want. It, Sometimes there's a physical reason that X, say, or time, say, would be the independent variable, but sometimes there's actual experimental reasons that it can't be, okay? So it, you always are supposed to graph the dependent variable on the vertical axis and the independent variable on the horizontal axis. Uh, and if, if there's some something about the experiment or something about the, the theory or whatever you're working on that dictates that one is independent and the other one's independent, then you have to use that rule specifically to graph them. Okay, so keep that in mind. But once we, once we graph the de dependent variable on the vertical axis and the horizontal uh, axis is, gets the independent variable, then we're gonna try all those different powers until we find a linear operation. And then, think, uh, thanks to Newton, we were able to discover some calculus methods by which you could find the absolute best line of best fit. And that requires what we call, uh, in case of linear graphs, linear regression, but it's basically just regression. So you can imagine all the possible lines that connect uh, or that connect or, or represent a, a piece of data or a bunch of data. 
and you try to choose the one that has the minimal amount of error in it and minimal amount of error in some cases you can sort of think of plot the data and then draw your line of best fit and then draw a perpendicular to the line to each of the data points so you'd have like a line dots above and below but you'd have these little distances perpendicular from the line to the individual data points if you added up all those little distances for all the data points uh, that would be some net result of how far off your graph is. If you then did some calculus to uh, minimize that number, then you would get a line of best fit. And that's that's more or less what linear regression is. And uh, in general, that's what regression is. So you'll see today, for instance, in Excel, uh, we can do that regression process, not only for linear graphs, we can do it for logarithmic, we can do it for exponential, we can do it for quadratic, we can do it for any polynomial, we can do trig functions, all sorts of cool stuff like that. So that's what today's lab is about. Uh, if you hadn't had 241, this might be new to you, but if you had 241, you've been doing this all last semester or the last time you took this class, the 241 class, so you know how it is. So that's what I'm going to do is I'm going to reintroduce you to Excel, how to use Excel for those things, and then uh, we're going to use that for the rest of the semester, uh, just like we did in 241. But now mm -hmm. this semester, we're going to be uh, experimenting not with basic kinematics and uh, stuff of that sort, but we might do something in fluid mechanics, we'll do some stuff in thermodynamics, and we'll do a lot of stuff in electricity and magnetism. Okay. Anybody have any questions on that? Mm -hmm. And normally I, I, I do a lot of writing on my iPad when I'm uh, talking over the internet like this uh, for Zoom meetings. There wasn't much reason for it to uh, for me to do it here. That's why I haven't yet. So don't worry. Uh, you guys paid for a face-to-face -face class. You're not going to be subjected to this internet class. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, ideally, it'll be Tuesday and Thursday of next week, or excuse me, Monday and Wednesday of next week, and that'll be it. Uh, hopefully, it's not even that, but I, I'm I'm pretty sure I'm still going to have to stay home next week, too. So, again, I apologize, guys. Y'all didn't sign up for that, but I, I will be very uh, lenient and gracious and, and work hard to help you with anything you don't understand because I know this is my fault and it, it shouldn't be uh, you that's subject to it. All right. Uh, anything now before we jump into me sharing the screen with Excel? Okay. All right, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And what I'm going to do is I am going to introduce you. Well, I thought I was going to share my screen, but it's not. Oh, there it is. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to share my screen with you. And uh, let's say no with that. Uh, what you're looking at is just a big Excel spreadsheet. Uh, it might not be mm -hmm. as big as you'd like it. In fact, I'm going to upsize it a little bit in case there's any difficulty seeing this stuff. So hopefully you all will be able to see uh, the actual formulas I type in and the numbers I point, type in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use something that anybody that's had uh, the equivalent of 241 should already know. Uh, let's define some initial parameters. Let's imagine, uh, for instance, we're throwing a ball straight upward. The mm -hmm. param Go ahead. I thought I heard somebody ask a question. No. Okay. Oh, no, I was probably talking to myself. Let me mute it. I was putting the Excel on a different computer. Oh, okay, so gotcha. Along. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, if you've got noises in the background, I don't mind uh, if they're really quiet. But if not, yeah, do, do mute. But I don't mind you not being muted because I'd much rather you be able to get my attention when you need to. Uh, I'm also going to take on my screen. I'm going to turn on my participants and my chats. Uh, that way I can see if anybody types anything, because a lot of people just prefer to type a comment to me rather than open their mouth and speak. So I've got that off to the side. Hopefully that all works. So one of the parameters when, when you're throwing an object upward is the initial velocity. So I'll say, uh, I'm going to type in here, initial velocity. Evidently, I was in a different window, so it started typing somewhere else. I'm going to type in initial velocity. And that'll be V sub zero, which I'll write VO like that, just because it's it's kind of a nightmare to try to put superscripts and subscripts within a data cell in Excel. So I'm just going to put that there, and I'm going to make this 
column kind of wide. Everybody see how I just made this column wide? If I hover over the gap between two columns or between two rows, it makes a little shape like that. And then I can just click and, and move it left to right all I need. Okay. Uh, and actually, I want this to be uh, like an accurate piece of data that you use in, in a lab setting. So what I also do is put in meters per second. That way I know not only the symbol, but I know the variable that I'm using the symbol for and the units. So let me get rid of these parentheses. I think it'd be better to just do the parentheses like that. So let's say the initial velocity is, uh, and there's a good reason for me doing this. Let's say it's four times the acceleration of gravity, but measured in meters per second. Uh, and I said that specifically, and I don't need to take the time to multiply by four because, you know, Excel is like one of the most awesome calculators there are. So notice that I typed equals in there and I'm going to do four times 9.80. So I just hit four times and times is the asterisk, asterisk button, which is on uh, shift eight. And then I put 9.80 and I hit return and it printed out that number. Now, now this is like a data table that you'd have an experimental setup because it don't only have a number, it actually has the units. So you either got to put the unit like in this cell next to it or over there, or sometimes if you have a column, you can put the, the units up here at the top and then allow the numbers to be below and everybody understands that. Uh, yeah, I, uh, sorry, Mark, I just saw your post. You, it would be best if you had Excel open so you can try stuff like this. And uh, I believe Logan and Micah are supposed to be here. I haven't, I uh, do see Logan. I don't see Micah yet. Uh, but I did email you guys my actual uh, lab write-up because neither of you, as far as I know, are in this actual Canvas page. So if, if you don't have this document that we're using for lab today, uh, it'll be in your email. If you guys have my Canvas page, then you'll just find it in week one. All right. So, yes, initial velocity is definitely one of the parameters regarding throwing a ball upward. Another parameter is what's the initial height? Which I'll call Y0. And that'll be measured in meters. And let's just make it something simple like uh, 2.3, zero. Now notice if I type 2.30, Excel doesn't know any difference between 2.30 and 2.3. And calculators generally don't because mathematically speaking, there is no difference. But remember in the experimental world, uh, 2.30 will maybe cost you a factor of 10 more than 2.3. So if you go to a machine shop and you ask them to, to make something for you and you say, uh, I need it at with a radius of 2.72 centimeters, that's going to come up to some price. And then if you go back and say, no, I need it to 2.725 centimeters, that's probably going to cost you a factor of 10 more. And if you go another decimal place, they might not even be able to do it, or they're definitely going to charge you even more money. So in the experimental world, it's important to understand that there's a huge difference between uh, basically 2.3 and 2.30 and 2.300. So we've got that. And then the final parameter that really matters in throwing a ball up, anybody want to guess that? I'll tell you that it would be different on the moon. So Gravity? There you go. Gravitational acceleration. Thanks. Nice to have you back, Elizabeth. And that's going to be what we call, I do not want that A capitalized. Ah. And that's going to be a quantity uh, G, which is measured in meters per second per second. And uh, since I said the ball uh, was had an initial velocity of 39.2, and I said it was thrown up, I've already decided that the vertical upward direction is positive, so I have no choice but writing negative 9.80 for the acceleration due to gravity. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, what we might want to do is maybe we want to know how fast the ball will be going 
at some point in time later. Uh, maybe we'll also want to know how high it is at some point in time later. So I'm going to do both of those analyses using our knowledge of uh, kinematics that we learned last semester. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to type uh, velocity. All right, let's do the, yeah, I'll do velocity. And I'll call it V of T. And that is in meters per second. So there's another column. Actually, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and do this. I'm going to put it over here so it fits better. So that's the velocity as a function of time. No, I don't want to do that. i tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to put it back over here. And I'm going to widen this column, and that'll be just fine. Okay, because what I want here is time. And that's the variable T, and it's measured in seconds. Okay, and I'm going to take time, and I could just look at every second, but that's not going to give me enough data points. So what I'll do is I'll put the first time to be T equals zero. And then I want, uh, let's say, every half second after that. Now, I could type in 0. 0.5 and then 1 and then 1. 1.5 and then 2 and so on and so forth. But again, we have the, one of the best calculators in the world right here. So I'm going to say equals. Remember, when you start off a cell in Excel with an equal symbol, it's already expecting to do a calculation. OK, what calculation is it going to do? Well, I'm going to tell it to grab the cell immediately above, which notice is in column A and row seven. So I'm going to say dollar sign. Well, I don't have to say dollar sign, by the way. Uh, I would just say A7. I'll discuss the dollar sign later, but I'll say A7. Notice how automatically that variable turned blue and the box, that A7 uh, box turned blue as well. I'm going to say A7 plus 0 0.5. So that says the next time interval, uh, the next time that we're going to look at the data is 0.5 seconds. Now, here's the cool part. Uh, I, you think, well, crap, you haven't saved yourself any time. You're going to type that every time, but you don't. All I have to do is highlight that one, and I grab with my left mouse button, I grab that corner box, and I pull it down. And that gives me up to 11 and a half seconds. Remember I said uh, basically 39.2 was 4 times 9.8. What that helps me know is that I'm going to have basically 4 seconds for it to reach its max height. So really it's going to reach a height, a max height at 4 seconds. And then at 8 seconds, it's going to be right back where it started from. And then if I'm lucky enough to have thrown it near the edge of a cliff, uh, and it's a cliff that's a straight drop, then it has the ability to go to low numbers as well. So the height's lower than zero. And that's what I've done by allowing it to go up to 11 and a half seconds. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. So now I've got my time data. And what I suggested to you guys is that I wanted to make a graph of velocity versus time. So I can see, you know, how this thing's going to behave over time. So we know from... Uh, our kinematics experience from the equivalent of physics 241 that the formula for velocity when you have a constant acceleration is the initial velocity v0 plus a times t. So I'm going to just use that formula. And this is a case where I am going to use the dollar sign because what the dollar sign does is the dollar sign in front of an a locks the column to column a. The dollar sign in front of a number three, for instance, locks the row to row three. So in this case, I am planning on taking this formula and dragging it down. So if I didn't put a dollar sign in front of the column number, it wouldn't matter at all. But if I didn't put a, col a number in front of the row sign, it would matter a lot because it would keep going for numbers lower and lower. So I'm supposed to take the initial velocity which again, I don't want it to change, but as I said, uh, it doesn't matter. I'm not going left and right, so I don't have to worry about putting a dollar sign in front of the column number. I only have to worry about putting a dollar sign in front of the row number, and that row number is one. Okay, oops, and it might help if I choose the proper column. Uh, brought to your moron instructor. <laughs> brought to you by your moron instructor today. So, 
<laughs> so there's my initial velocity. Everybody understand why I did the dollar sign there? Okay. And it's plus. Now I'm, oh, it's plus. Now I've got to use, remember, it's V0 plus AT. So I got to add the A and the T. The A is up there in B3. So I'm going to say, this time I'll do a dollar sign, even though I still don't need it just to show you that it doesn't cause a problem. So I'm going to say B and then I'm going to say dollar sign three again, because when I pull this down, uh, the very next row would make an error because the very next row would pull the empty, uh, the empty cell right below negative 9.8. And, and there's no number there. So it wouldn't work if I hadn't done the, the dollar sign three. And now I do the asterisk for multiplication. And now I'm going to choose it for the time immediately to the left. Now, when I pull down to the next row, I want to use the time immediately to that left. And when I do the next row, it's immediately that left. So I don't want any dollar signs on this guy. And look, I don't even have to type it in. All I had to do is click in the cell, and it will automatically give me the right uh, column and, and row number. Does that make sense to everyone? I, I know this is probably boring as crap because uh, you have already covered all this, but it's just something we got to go through. Uh, the good news is, when I'm done showing you this, I'll let you loose and you can go do your own thing. If you want to stay here and work on it uh, in groups, that's fine. Or if you just want to go home and do it later, that's fine too. So I I'll make it up to you that way. So now what I've got is that the velocity at t equals zero is upwards since it's positive and it's 39.2, which is exactly what we want it to be because that's the initial velocity we gave it, right? But check this out. I can now take that box and copy that formula all the way down just like this. And boom, it gives me the velocities at each time. Now notice the neat thing is, uh, you can see sort of the neat little tricks we can do. We, uh, when we learned about the kinematics of constant acceleration, we learned that constant acceleration means the velocity changes by the same amount every second. And if you look at this in 39.2 to 29.4, that's a one second difference. The velocity has changed by 9.8. In fact, 9.8 has been sub subtracted from it. If I go another second, it should be 29.4 minus 9.8. Well, that should be, lo and behold, 19.6. So you see it's all working exactly as we expected. Isn't that awesome? All right. So now what I would like to do is be able to show that in graphical representation. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight that column, which is the X data, and this column, which is the Y data, and I pull it all down. And now I go up here to, I think it's insert. It's been a while. So yes, insert. And over here, you'll see when I click over this, it normally says some words. It's, it's choosing not to do that now because it wants to make a liar out of me. But I'm going to click that assemblage of points. And down here, I can see scatter. So that's what I want to do. We never, in sciences, we do not connect the dots. OK, we try to draw lines of best fit. We do not connect the dots. So it's almost always best to just do a scatter plot. Boom, there's our scatter plot. And what we need to check, just because, you know, some people say Y versus X, and then say, some people say uh, X on the horizontal axis, Y on the vertical axis, and you don't know whether or not you did your stuff properly. So what I would like to do is at least check one data point and make sure that they're all uh, in the right order. In other words, the x's are being graphed or the times are being graphed on the x-axis and the velocities are being graphed on the y-axis. So I can click right here and it says series 1.1 has an x value of 1, which corresponds to that right there. And it has a Y value of 29.4, which corresponds to that right there. So yes, it is definitely uh, graphing it appropriately. Does that make sense? Okay. Now you can do things like you can change the chart title. You can say V, uh, v in meters per second versus T in seconds for a ball thrown upward. So that's a pretty good title. I also want to show you some other things. I could do this. Notice what popped up in this is a format axis. 
So that allows me to change the smallest number on the y-axis, the largest number on the y-axis, how often tick marks occur. Maybe I don't want tick marks every 10 or every 20. Maybe I want them every 10. And I can do that. Uh, you can have it choose... Uh, uh, actually, the horizontal axis cross. So I'll let you play with that. I hadn't even thought about that for a while, so I, I can't even remember exactly what it did. It does allow you to make a logarithmic scale, and that could be base 10 or base E, whatever you mark, whatever you want. You can also put labels on it. So let's say the label is next to the axis, and uh, I think that's good next to axis. And then we can put numbers. It could show the actual numbers if you wanted to. That's all good. Uh, let's see if there's anything else I want to jump out and speak with. Uh, if I do put a label in here, it's going to make the text direction horizontal. I would like it to be uh, vertical like this. No, I'll take vertical like this. Okay. Now I'll kill that. And now you can see the vertical axis is in fact uh, going in increments of 10, like we said, and it actually counts downward horizontally. I don't like my numbers like that, but I do like my label like that. So that's why I actually did it was I was thinking I was addressing the uh, axis, but I, I mean the label axis, but I was not. So, oops, I'm on the wrong thing. So I double clicked again on the numbers and uh, I'm gonna go back to, no, not that one. No, not that one. Axis options. Labels next to axis is fine. Uh, I had the number. I can't now. I can't find where I changed the number uh, to be that way. Maybe it's this one. Text direction. There you go. So now I can change it back to that. I, I really don't like the numbers being different, but normally I do write the vertical on the vertical axis. I'll write a, a table next to it. Now, other things you can do is with chart design, you can look at all these designs up here and make it fit that model. And some of them are different than others. Some of them have a black background. Some of them have a, a black that fades into gray and then fades back to black, all sorts of stuff like that. There are also uh, fancy designs where you could actually have uh, labels beside the vertical axis and all that good stuff. There's a bunch of different ways you can do that. Uh, I'm gonna look back over here, see if there's anything else. All right. Uh, now let's click on, I just clicked on the whole graph by itself. And what I'm looking for is change chart type. So all that stuff's still good. We're still wanting something like that. There's a pie chart, there's a hierarchy, there's a statistical plot, X, Y scatter plot. Uh, you can look around in here. I don't see anything different, but sometimes you'll find, and I'm, I'm actually literally looking for them in real time. Uh, sometimes there's a place where it'll actually show you a graph with the actual axis labeled and the axis labeled and stuff like that. And you can click on that and it'll do it automatically. Uh, this is, I just updated my Excel and, I'm, and it's been maybe a year since I had done that. So I'm in a, at a loss trying to find it. Uh, bring the front, bring the back. None of this looks, uh, let's say format chart area. I bet you that might be it. No line, solid line. Uh, ash type, fill, none of that. Let's check this. Let's check this size. So you can lock the aspect ratio so that, you know, a, a left movement of two units is the same as a right a vertical movement of two units. We normally don't do that, but when we don't fix it that way, that means we can't just count squares on graph paper to find out the slope. You actually got to subtract data points. Uh, I don't see any other things that come out on here. Let's see, text options, uh, no line, no line, pattern, nope. None of the stuff I was looking for there, shadow. Vertical alignment in the middle, okay. Oh, so text box, it might actually allow me to do that. So let's do that real quick. And I'm gonna say, keep it on horizontal and I'll close this. And now I'm gonna say insert and I'm looking for text box. So this is a quick and dirty way of doing it. Uh, it's not the preferred way, obviously, but you can say, like that. And then I can take this box, make it smaller and like this. 
And not only that, I can change some formatting issues that could be important by right clicking on the box. And I'll look at the format object. And what I want is no fill, because if I had a fill there, even with it white, it would completely black out everything that box covers. I don't want that, right? So uh, I don't want that. And I could have no line because right now you see there's a black line all the way around it. Uh, I could have a solid line. That's going to make it stay, but I really don't want a line. So I'm going to shrink this up as much as I can. And ideally, I'd be able to widen this area, shrink that, and then move this over to here. But it's not letting me do that yet. So... That was a quick and dirty way, but not necessarily the way that I want it because it just keeps expanding the graph with all that. Uh, anyways, it would be nice to figure out how to do that. I'm, I haven't done it yet. And in fact, it's not even touching the horizontal axis. So let me kill this. I'll just click on the box as opposed to in the box. And then if I hit delete, it disappears. Okay. So I was trying to tell you how to make it prettier. Y'all probably are more proficient at this. Y'all probably use Excel more often than I do. I pretty much use it for the labs that it's used for. And then occasionally when I try to solve the differential equation or something, I'll use Excel to do that. But that's about it. And that's, you know, that's usually like when I'm doing personal research or fun stuff. Uh, that being said, the part that's really important right now is your ability to now do a curve fit. Okay. So what do we do to make a curve fit? Well, what I'm going to do is I can right click on the graph and it'll bring up all sorts of stuff. And it, let me see if this is the one that does it. Nope. Let's try nothing there as well. Select template, select data, format, plot area. Nope. So I'm going to go back to, let's look at data, see if that's the case. Let's see, insert. There was another way I could do it, but it wasn't, it's not doing it right now. Still not there. Where did all this stuff go? Nothing in there. Anybody recall or anybody use the most recent form? I'm just trying to add a, a curve fit to it. Yeah, it uh, prof Professor, I think it's on the, well, if you, hop, you hover on the right side, uh -huh. there's that little filter thing. Little, yeah, that's what I was looking for. I'm not, down. Yeah, I'm not seeing that filter pop up. That's what, that's what I usually use. I usually just select the data itself. Okay, let's try that. And then from there, you can usually find the, or no, no, I mean like on the graph, like the oh, point. Okay, gotcha. So you're talking like, oh, maybe not. Yeah, like right, right clicking the data or select data, the thing you saw earlier. Yeah. Do that. Oh, ah, format, add trend line. There you go. There so you go. that's what I was looking for. Uh, notice what uh, I think it was Elijah told me. Uh, it, what I did was I clicked on the data point. Uh, and I right clicked it spe right click specifically. So make sure you know that again, uh, this is a little different. There used to be a little uh, funnel like Jerry was talking about up there. It's not there anymore. I don't know what happened, but I'm going to do add trend line. And if it has the option of more, you always select more because it has something that it's planning on doing, which might not be what you want. In this case, I do want a linear graph. I, I could in fact, force the intercept to be zero if I wanted by clicking that. You can see that is not a good data, uh, a good match for the data. So obviously we don't want that. But what I do want is to just display the equation on the chart and I want to display the R squared value. Okay, the R squared value is a statistical measure of how good the curve matches the data. Now, I literally use the exact equation to generate the data, so this should be a perfect curve fit, right? If I wanted to make it not a perfect curve fit, I could, like, add a random number to the to the Y variable uh, for each of them, and that would make them off a little bit, and then it would be more realistic. But we've done what we were shooting for, which is specifically creating a curve fit for this data. And you know the equation is supposed to be y, uh, V is equal to V0 plus AT, and look what it has. The V is represented by Y, so I can go ahead and type in uh, V of T. Whoa. 
like that. And and that's the ideal thing to turn into me. I don't like seeing Y equals MX plus B format when I don't have any uh, Y or X variables. So now I can go in here and I can replace the X with T. And maybe even I'll put a little space in there and that's it. So now what we have is the actual curve fit. And the fact that R squared is equal to one tells us that the curve fit is perfect. Ideally, what you're shooting for is a R squared as close to one as possible. And sometimes you get a better one if you, for instance, uh, set the intercept to zero or set the intercept to one. So if you have a physical reason for the intercept being a specific number, then yeah, it might be best for you to go ahead and set the intercept. And if it gives you a better R value, then you know that's a good way to, to choose. There's always a debate though, uh, in the event that you know physically it's supposed to be uh, set the intercept to such and such. And then when you set the intercept to such and such, the R value gets worse. Uh, really at the end of the day, we're supposed to be doing experimental physics. So the data is what holds the day. So we do the one with the best curve fit with the data we have, okay? Any question on that? <laughs> All right. So that's a typical thing that we'll do. You could do other things. And oh, there's a, I've been sitting here looking for the Y, I mean, for the X axis numbers down here, but I for completely forgot they were up there. But again, it doesn't give me much to label the axes or anything. So we've got that graph done. Let's take it up a notch. Let's do something a little more complicated. I'm just going to move this graph off to the side. And now I'm going to make another column because I would like to know why uh, the height as a function of time. So height. In meters. OK. So that's the column I'm going to make next. And you guys probably remember the kinematic equation for getting the height as a function of time. Uh, we said x is equal to 1 half at squared plus v0 t plus x0. In this case, we're doing y. So what I'm going to say is the height is equal to 0 0.5 times. Now I need the acceleration, 1 half at squared. So I'm going to say uh, b, and then I'm going to choose dollar sign 1. And remember, the dollar sign has to be on the row because I'm going to pull the data downward. If I had to pull the data downward and left or just left or just right or just right, uh, any of that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, I sort of repeated myself there. If I had to do that, then, yeah, I might want to put a dollar sign on both of them. But in this case, I don't have to. So that's one half A times. Now I'm going to take I'm going to put this in parentheses. There's other ways of doing this, but I'll put the time close parentheses, then I'll use my caret symbol, which is shift six, and then I'll put two. So that's y equals one half at squared. Now, Excel automatically knows that the exponent is the very next thing after the caret key, and it knows it's exactly one number. So unless I put parentheses around the two uh, that included the plus, it's not going to confuse and try to add the plus to the exponent. So, you know, that's just common order of operation stuff. So one half AT squared plus V zero, our V zero was, uh, oops, I used the wrong thing. I, I was thinking to myself, did I type that wrong earlier? It was supposed to be, uh, I guess it's supposed to be column C, sorry. Nope. Oh, row three, that's what it was. Notice it, it highlighted the wrong variable for me for acceleration. So let me fix this again. So I've got not three, but specifically I wanted B3. So it should be, if I'm in the right spot, B dollar sign three. So I suspect a, a bunch of you actually uh, caught me in that error and just didn't say anything. So uh, good if you did. If you didn't, uh, pay a little bit better attention because uh, I'm a goober and I do that stuff. All right, now I got to add the initial velocity, which is the actually B1. So again, I can or I don't have to, but I'm going to do it this time. B 
dollar sign V dollar sign one. I really don't need that dollar sign in front of the V, but I did it just to show you again that it's okay even if you use it. So that's V zero times T. So I'm again going to click over here. I do want this variable to go down with me so I don't put any dollar signs in there. And now I'll say plus the initial position, which will be B dollar sign two. So if we look, and our first test should be, does it give me back the right answer at t equals zero? And clearly it does, right? So now I can pull that formula down. Notice all the data, there is no number that doesn't have a unit, unless specifically there's a number that is a pure number without units. Uh, all denominate numbers on stuff you turn in for lab should actually have the unit with the number, either directly with the number or at the top of the column or at the left-hand side of the row or something. And, and my, my data does show that, okay? So now what I need to do is I need to make a graph of Y of T on the vertical axis and T on the horizontal axis. So I'm gonna select the time data and then I'm gonna come over to the height data, and I'm going to hold down my command button on a Mac. I think it's a control button if you're on a PC. But notice I did the time one first. Uh, that's what I've learned that automatically puts the first column you select on the horizontal axis and the second column you select on the vertical axis. Now I can do insert, see if the wording comes up. It's still not showing me stupid words. I always like that. It just would highlight and show you a little word to represent some. Let's see if any of the other ones are doing it. Nope. Looks like everything's not doing it. All right. So I'm going to do scatter plot. And that's exactly the graph we expected, right? It's a parabola. So that all worked out. We can still do the same things that I was talking about earlier and the things that I failed at, uh, labeling the vertical axis, labeling the horizontal axis. Uh, I've obviously failed on figuring out how to do that. I'll have that uh, knowledge for you by our next lab. Uh, you guys should definitely work on trying to do it because your graphs look better. I ideally don't want the, the label of a vertical graph, for instance, to go horizontal because it'll make too much of the graph taken up by the actual label. So make it vertical parallel to the axis. And then the ver the horizontal data, the label on that, that doesn't matter if it's at the bottom, uh, as long as it's horizontal. And even if it was vertical, it wouldn't be a problem, but I wouldn't write it that way. Okay. In your, uh, just so, just to tell you now, in your top left, there's add chart elements. Okay. And that'll let you do your uh, titles properly. Oh, there it is. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't even, I never even seen that button. Actually, it might have been here before and I just didn't notice it. But yeah, well, so here's you mentioned your you're on a Mac. That's where all my issues came from. I'm also doing Excel on a Mac. I remember coming to you a couple of times for things that I couldn't see. Right. It's just a Mac thing. I don't know yeah, why. If you're in the in the uh, Windows world, it's a little differently laid out. And generally, I've, I've liked the Mac version better than the Microsoft's Word version. I mean, uh, Windows version. But yeah, this is where you can do all that stuff. And this is what we were looking for earlier. I, I do no longer see that funnel. Maybe you have the funnel on your Windows version. But notice here it says trend line. I don't want to hit, even in that last graph, I wouldn't want to hit just linear. This is what I was talking about is you want to hit more because you need more details. You need to be able to tell it to put the equation on the graph. You need to be able to tell it to put the R squared value, all that good stuff. But I'm going to say more trend line options. Now, this one is clearly not linear, right? And you all know exactly what kind of polynomial it is, don't you? First order, second order, third order? Second. Yeah, second order because one half A T squared. So I'm going to show you how bright Excel is. I'm going to make a, let's make a fourth order polynomial. Now we know this is a second order polynomial and we know we made really good data points for a second order polynomial because we use the actual formula we're trying to derive. So I'm going to do that. I'm also going to display the equation on the chart and display the R squared data. And now boom, we're done. Okay, so check this out. It does have a time squared and a time cubed and a time to the fourth, but look at the coefficient of time to the fourth. It's six times 10 to the negative 14. So that literally means zero decimal place, 13 zeros, and then the six. It also has a T cubed term, 
but the coefficient on that one is negative one times sin to the negative 12. So that's zero or negative zero decimal point, 11 zeros, and then T cubed. So yeah, that's, that's essentially zero in other words. So what we do get, in fact, is negative one half of 9.8. That's what negative 4.9 is. T squared plus V zero, 39.2 times T plus Y zero, which is 2.3. So again, we could go in here and I'm going to click and change that to Y. Actually, I want a lowercase Y. And then I'm going to change all these guys to T. And again, we got a perfect fit where R squared is exactly equal to one. Okay. So that's something neat. Uh, there's also something else I discovered. Uh, let's do this to see if I can generate it again. I found, I discovered this about seven eighths of the way through last semester. Uh, and it actually ended up, a couple of years ago, buying software that would allow a certain analysis to be done that I didn't think Excel did. Excel does not do a good job with it, but it still does it. So I'm going to try to find that again. Uh, what I would like to do is take this data and then I'm going to say on the graph, actually, maybe I can do it this way. Let's click on this graph. Uh, I was hoping that thing would come up here. Let's look at data, see if it does that. No. No. Where did that button go? Elijah? <laughs> what 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 you heading to, do I gotta be on? Click on the graph. You have to click on the graph first, like the yeah. whole graph. Maybe I have to click over here then. Still didn't come up. No, if you like Make sure it's in home, maybe. I don't know. And then click on the whole graph, like like the border of it or something, just like one click. Yeah, not seeing anything. Uh, chart design. No. Let's see if I did. Ah, there you go. Add there chart element. Okay. So uh, what I would really like to do with this one is I'd like to take with this data, I can say equals... So this is a way that it will automatically spit out the slope from a linear regression. A7 to B30. Oh, excuse me. It's supposed to be known wise. So that's uh, B7 to B30. B7 colon B30, like that. And then comma, known X's, that would be A7 colon A30. Whoa, I don't know how to type a two instead of an A. So that's a neat new thing that will allow you to just get the slope out, and then you can do intercept. And again, I'm going to do the Ys, which is B7 colon B30, comma, A7 colon A30, close parentheses. And that gives me the Y-intercept. But what I discovered before was you can actually get an error. So it uh, looks like that's maybe have been taken away. That's not the, let's see. Let's do a quick search for, I think this is the help search. Maybe not. No, that's the shirt sheep. I think, there it is. No, it's the search to see too. Uh, where is it? So under statistical, I think it where it would be. Histogram box and whisper. Oh, so it's it's evidently. Uh, 
let's say I'm going to just try to read what it says about trend line in general. And see, because what I found last semester was literally a way that will give me not only like I just showed you the slope and the intercept, it would actually give me the error in the slope it calculated and the error in the intercept it calculated. So you would know exactly how many sig figs you're supposed to be using are more specifically when we get into error analysis and propagation, we could do it with uh, with the actual sigmas and all that good stuff. But it looks like. It looks like I, uh, they've moved it, and I'll have to try to find that for next time. So I'll introduce that to you next time. Uh, by all means, if you can find that, if you can find a way to figure out what the error is in each of these coefficients are in the slope and intercept here, uh, you can turn that in, and I'll call that an extra credit. Uh, that'll replace your lowest homework score with 100. So uh, you're welcome to do that. But we're done. We're, we're, we've basically finished everything that I would like you to do. Uh, let me show you now. I'm going to stop sharing this screen. Anybody had any questions about that? I can pull up the screen too if there's something you wanted to ask me specifically about that graph. But does anybody have any questions for me? All right. So the I want to say, oh, hold on. I, I do want to say I found everything on Pearson. They must have been updating the website or something in the last gotcha. couple of days. So I, everything's back to normal. Oh, cool. Good deal. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. That was good. I thought I turned. Okay. All right. So this is week one. Uh, I'm getting ready to share my screen with you now. I finally found the screen that I want to share with you. Thanks for that, Shanda. Uh, so I'm not doing the Excel now. I wanted to show you the actual lab that you're supposed to do. And it's really trivial. Again, I can open up uh, rooms, breakout rooms like we do in Zoom, and you can go off in pods of three and, and work with one another. Or you can just, if you want to leave, you can do that. I don't mind. Uh, you're counted for roll today. But the main thing is I wanted you to know that this is where you're going to turn your spreadsheet review in. Notice I'm now in real time changing the due date so that it will be the appropriate due date. Uh, I'm going to go to January. Today's the 10th. Your labs in general always do at 9 a.m. of the next lab unless I tell you otherwise. So that's the due date for that. And now you know where to sign, uh, where to actually do it. I did give you the general instructions in case you didn't have me last semester. The way we are turning in labs right now, at least in this transitionary period, is you're taking my original Word document and you're going to turn that whole thing back in, but you're going to do more than that as well. You are going to turn that in and you're going to have fill in all the ans all the answers. So if they ask you a question, I want you to click your cursor right at the end of that question, right next to the question mark, and hit return, return, open up some space, and then start typing your answer in right there in a color font other than black. And you know, don't want make ones that are hard for me to read. Like I said, the the darkish blue or the middle medium blue would be is sort of the ideal one. Uh, yellows are bad bright fluorescent greens are bad so don't do that stuff to me but anyways this is where you're going to turn it in once you're once you're finished answering all those questions with a different color font filling in the data with a different color font uh doing your sample calculations all that good stuff all of those have to be put in the proper place in the lab report itself and then you just turn the whole lab report back in in other words this document that i'm opening right now is what you're going to turn in and that's why i give it to you in word format so you can completely edit it okay so this is spreadsheet basics and he talks about things like uh the columns and rows and the dollar symbols and all that uh, he tells you, which might not be uh, that valid in, in light of the newer version of Excel or in light of me using a Mac version, uh, he, it, some of these instructions not, might not be perfect. I think they are, but uh, I think they should be good, especially if you're using a Windows machine. But the first thing they're going to want you to do is take this data that we made up from uh, literally calibrating a spectroscope, and they're wanting you to make a graph of... Uh, basically the wavelength on the vertical axis, so these numbers on the vertical axis and these numbers on the horizontal axis, and then they're wanting you to fill in the slope right here 
and the intercept right here of a line of best fit. So this is where you would click in there and start typing your answer in a different color font. As I said, medium blue would be a good one. All right. Then they have some data regarding the acceleration of electrons. And they're going to make you uh, ask you to plot Y versus X. And it says print a copy. Whenever it says print a copy, or even if it doesn't say print a copy, I still would like to see your data tables, and I'd like to see your graphs. Even if they didn't ask for them, I want to see them. And because we're not printing it out, it's not a waste of paper. But right here is where it's saying print a copy. So right here is where I want you to insert your graph. How do you insert a graph? Well, you can come over here and you can do it. Well, actually, you're not looking at that now. So hold on a second. Uh, let me stop sharing and let me start sharing. So now I'm going to share my Excel spreadsheet again. Now, uh, those of you using Mac uh, are using a Windows machine. Y'all have a, I think it's called Snip or something like that. There's a little app that you can mount on your bar at the bottom uh, that looks like a pair of scissors. It's called the Snipping Tool. And uh, you can do that. Or in this case, I'll do Command Shift 3. And it just automatically takes a photograph of the whole screen. And then I would highlight the small part of it that I want by clicking in the top left corner and diagonally follow, uh, pulling the cursor down to the bottom right corner. Uh, and then letting it go when I've got the whole thing included. Then I go to Tools, Crop, and you end up getting a graph like this. So let me show you the graph I just got. So that's what happened when I cut that little bit out of the screen. Now you have something that you can save as a JPEG or a GIF or whatever you want to do, and you're going to use your uh, Word software, your Microsoft Word, and just insert that right in where it asked for it. That's what your labs are going to be every week. Uh, again, we usually do one or more labs where you actually have to do a formal write-up with intro and uh, all that stuff. Uh, other than those labs, this is what you're going to generally do. So anybody have any questions on that? Once all that is done, once you've got that Word document where every question it asks has a, uh, a type set answer in a different color font, so I can recognize that it's something you wrote, and that includes the answers, even in the, the questions, even in the introduction. Sometimes there's rhetorical questions. I don't think any of this labs that we do in the semester, I don't think any of them have rhetorical questions. But in general, you wouldn't be required to answer rhetorical questions. But all the questions you should answer because they're asking that you of them, uh, them of you specifically so you can uh, learn a little bit and understand better what we're doing. So definitely put those answers in there and uh, definitely put all the graphs in there and all that good stuff. Uh, once all the answers, once all the data, once all the graphs, and you can even make extra data tables if you want, and once all the sample calculations are put in, then you save that Word document with your first name and your first initial of your last name in the title somewhere. You save that as a Word document, and then you do File, Save As, and this time you save it as a PDF. And that's what you turn in at that site that I just showed you where I set the date on. Uh, Logan asked about being confused about what to do right after it asked to complete the equation. Okay. Are you talking about when you actually asked to do the trend line? No, it's like um, it asked for you to complete the equation and then the paragraph right after that, it says create a spreadsheet. Um, yeah, I'm just a little bit confused about that part. Okay. I don't really know what to do. Yeah, let me look at that part of the, the lab, and I'll share that screen again. Okay. So it says, highlight these five columns. Is this where you're talking about, or earlier in the lab, Logan? A little above that, like, um, where is it? Yeah, you see where it says complete the equation, the next paragraph where it says to create a spreadsheet. Okay, gotcha. 
So uh, complete the page. It says create a spreadsheet that uses the above equation to calculate lambda for any angle ranging from 10 to 30 degrees in two degree increments. In other words, basically what they're saying is the same thing I did right here with, uh, dang, I forgot, you don't see that. Uh, when we were in my Excel window, remember I'd made a data table for T, a, a column, and then I made a, a column for velocity, then I made another column for height. What they're telling you here is make a column for lambda, make a column for theta, and theta is going to be 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, all the way up to 30. So that's going to be your entries in your vertical column for theta. And then in your vertical column right next to it for lambda, you're going to type in lambda, or you're going to type in equals whatever number is right here that you got from your curve fit times, and then you click on the uh, theta again to the left, plus whatever number it got that, and that'll give you the formula. Does does that make sense? Or you want me to show you, show you it on uh, Excel? I got it. Yeah, you, you did get it. Anybody else need help? So. If one student has a problem with it, it's almost always likely that multiple students have a problem with it. Let me just show you, by the way, you guys are, are free to go at this point. If if you uh, know what you're doing to finish off this, you're welcome to leave. I'm going to go ahead and uh, pull open my Excel sheet again and show her exactly what they're talking about with this. So uh, let me do that real quick. Like I said, if you, you guys want to go, you're done. Uh, I will see you again at two o'clock for our class from two to three twenty. But let me stop sharing the screen and go back to sharing my spreadsheet. Have a good one, Mr. Younger. See you at two. Thank you. You too, bud. All right. So I've got the spreadsheet here. Now I'm sharing it with you. So what they're wanting you to do is put in a result for theta. Let's see. And theta was degrees. Right. So they're wanting you to put in 10. And then I'm going to say equals, so 12, and I'm going to go all the way up to 30. I went further than I needed to. Okay. There you go. So now that's 10 to 30, and now I'm going to do lambda. OK, that's supposed to be equal to, let's say for argument's sake that you got 112 times theta plus 54. So in other words, in that in that first set of parentheses, the number was 112 that you got from the curve fit. And that second set of parentheses, the number was 54. I just pulled those out of my butt. So I don't <laughs> they're not real. Don't worry about it. Uh, but you now have the ability to do a formula. And it gives you all those values. So that's what they're talking about when it says create a spreadsheet that uses the above equation to calculate lambda for any angle ranging from 10 degrees through 30 degrees in two degree increments. Uh, it has a parenthetical at that point, which is pretty straightforward. It's just telling you what I already showed you how to do. Highlight all parts of the spreadsheet that are visible on your screen beginning with A1, this may not include all your values, but is sufficient. Print this portion of the spreadsheet by uh, selecting selection and print what section of the print dialog box. So that's just telling you to include your data sort of stuff. So you can, again, right there where it says that, right at the end of the sentence, print this portion, blah, blah, blah. That's where you're going to insert a photo of your spreadsheet. OK. All right. So, Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Anybody else have any questions? Um, I just have one question, Professor. You talked about that Word document. Where do we access that? Okay. I'm. Uh, I actually got that. Who, who's this? This isn't Micah, is it? This is Mark. Uh, Mark. Okay. Uh, if you go in our uh, Canvas page, which I'm getting ready to sh uh, show you again now, if you go to our Canvas page, you click on Modules. And you go to this week's module, which is week one. 
By the way, this week zero is important, uh, but it's really not important until, well, except for these first three. These first three are important every semester all the time, but the rest of these are really, or maybe the first four, the rest of these are all important once you get to electricity and magnetism, which is chapter uh, 21. So ignore that for right now. But right here is where that document came from, Mark. Okay, that makes super good sense, sir. Thank you. No problem. Uh, you don't want to click on that and start working with it. You want to click on it and then download it uh, and then open it with Word. If you try to do it otherwise, it'll try to run Word over the Internet and all things get crazy at that point. Okay, thank you. See you at two. <laughs> all right. You're welcome. See you. Uh, you also know that there is a neat little extra credit down there. Uh, that's just a division problem that I learned from Richard Feynman. Uh, it's very interesting. I like doing it. And there's really no science to it, but it is a good practice for you guys to be proficient at your basic arithmetic, multiplication, division, adding, subtracting. So you can do that for extra credit and turn it in there. Uh, even though that was something I made last semester, it's still valid. So I'm going to edit it, make sure the the due date is appropriate. Oops, went too far. Oh, no, I didn't. Going to January. Going back to January, January, January. Uh, so I'm going to say this one will be due, I'll say it's the 17th. They'll say the 16th at 11.59. And 59 p.m. All right, so that's when that extra credit is due is 11.59 p.m. Uh, anybody have any other questions about anything else? No, that was all. Okay, Do is anybody here want to go to a breakout room and work out on this with other students? I've only got, uh, actually, I've only got four or three of you, so y'all can work right now with this. I don't even have to make a breakout room. No, Otherwise, I'm just going to do it on my own because it's just spreadsheets, right? We're just doing the spreadsheets and the formulas. We're not doing experiments. Um, exactly gonna just do it solo right now okay <laughs> yep, you're good to go elizabeth right, and logan you're okay or would y'all like to work together i'm good i'm okay. fine uh, I, I will be here uh so this is a good time where you can actually literally text me in real time and still until noon so if you have any problems while you're doing it text me you've got my personal phone number uh let me type it down here again since i'm so slack i didn't finish the syllabus yet I'm going to type it down here again so you guys will have it. But if you have any problems uh, from now till 12, go ahead and text me. Let me know your problem and I'll answer you in real time. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Have All a right, good one. I'm going to get to work. You too. Bye. 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 Logan, you're welcome to attend my uh noon class or excuse me my th two o'clock class for 242 if you wanted I, I but uh let me know because i know you're attending the night class so you don't need to but if you ever do just let me know i can send you a, a link to that as a uh, zoom meeting as well same thing with uh, elizabeth or anybody else for that matter all right well i'm gonna end it have a good day everybody thanks for coming i don't see the phone number ah oh that's because i sent it only to logan by mistake thanks Yeah, when someone uh, chats me, it, it automatically turns who I'm sending that to, to just that person. Now it's chatted it to everyone. You get that now, Elizabeth? Uh, let me know if you're having problems, Elizabeth. I know you do prefer the face-to-face -face class, so uh, just you know, contact me if you have any problems. And I, I want everybody to do that because this is All not... Right. Serious. I'm sorry about missing uh, Monday's two o'clock. I couldn't find the link for some reason. That's it's just as much my fault. It, you know, it came so close to the time for the meeting. And I certainly understand. But I did post the video already so you can find it there. Do you, do you know how to find that? Is it, do you need me any help uh, for me showing you what it was? I believe I found it, but I didn't try to open it since I didn't see it till like five minutes before class started. Uh, okay, no problem. Yeah, you can see it on my lab and master. I mean, on my YouTube channel. So let me know if you need anything. Okay. Thank All you. Right. You're welcome. Bye-bye.